The following program contains discussion of real-life law enforcement situations and may include graphic content and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to End of Watch with Bootsy and Sal. We're your hosts, Kevin Grogan and Lou Velosi. We'll weigh in on topics that affect the law enforcement community and invite guests who have their fingers on the pulse of our nation. With over 40 years of combined law enforcement experience, ranging from patrol to multi-million dollar federal investigations, we are not going to pull any punches. So welcome to End of Watch with Bootsy and Sal. I'm your host, Kevin Grogan, a.k.a. Bootsy. And I'm Uvo Lozzi, a.k.a. Sal. And we are back here at South Magazine headquarters in Savannah, Georgia. Man, it's been a little bit of a break, but it's thank you all for uh, coming back. It's um, been over a year, Bootsy. It's been over a year because of this pandemic and masks and all that kind of shit. So now we can actually sit next to each other, which he's pretty pleased about to get so close to me. But uh, <laughs> I bet he is, man. We're in a we're in a day and age where you know everything's kind of coming full circle. You know, for years they've been telling the police that they're a bunch of racist guys and they're out there, you know, targeting minorities and beating and killing uh, people. And Joe Biden just got on uh, the, the news the other day. Your buddy Joe Biden got on the news today talking about how violent crime is out of hand and you know murders are up forty one percent in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, what the fuck did you think? We've been telling our cops not to police anymore. And, and now you have everybody sitting back in a reactive stance. So, and the, the bad guys are taking advantage of that and that surprises anybody. Like, look, right. you know, we've said it on this show and continue to say it, you know, let our cops be our cops. Go out, do your jobs and be careful while you're doing it. Stay safe. All right, Bootsy, you're kind of jumping the gun here. Sorry, man. You're, you're, because... you're getting into this and we haven't introduced our guest yet. So, so let, let's get into that first. And then we can talk about the whole gun thing. So it has been a year uh, since we've done a show and uh, we finished really strong. We had some great guests at the end, uh, Sheriff David Clark and uh, Steve Murphy and Javier Pena from Narcos, Victor Avila. Uh, just, we, we just, we had a great run, man. And, and we're going to kick up a new season now. And we got a guy, we got Lou Pimber is our guest today. Um, Lou is a, former military guy he was an army guy and then he became law enforcement uh kind of like bootsy after his army stint and uh kind of like bootsy but not as cool right and uh lou worked undercover uh so he is an undercover brother of mine he also knows uh, another one of our former guests jay dobbins he worked with him and uh lou was with the haida drug task force uh which they those guys do incredible work they do great work and Lou then transitioned after law enforcement into an acting career uh, with great success to become an actor, an entrepreneur, um, just, and, and that's one thing we highlight on this show, Lou, is guys who, who after they leave, you know, the military and or law enforcement, who do great things, man, uh, because, because when you turn that page, you know, me and Bootsy have done that, when you go to the next chapter, uh, you know, you, we bring a lot of game having been in law enforcement, having been in the military and all that to, to the private sector. And Lou, you're, you're a great example of someone who is, who's done some really cool things. So Lou, welcome to the show, man. And hey, thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, man. Early in the morning over there in Arizona, man. Hey man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I've seen you guys and stuff before and uh, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Uh, I, I like your style and uh, thank you for having me. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, it's one of the toughest things for, for, for people like us is, to transition from where we go to something different. Sometimes change is hard for people, right? And, and uh, it, it was hard for me. And I, you know, for, I, look, I, I thought I was gonna be a law enforcement officer my whole life, you know, and, and I really did. And that was my intention. And, and uh, I, I almost was a law enforcement officer the rest of my life, you know? Uh, you know, I worked undercover for many years. I, I, I volunteered for stuff. I, that's all I wanted to do was work undercover drugs and stuff like that. That's all I wanted to do ever since I was a youngster. And, and uh, you know, I got hurt on the job and I had to go, I was forced to have to reinvent myself. And so the biggest challenge what I have found is with cops who have to, where their career stops or they, or they retire is that identity. They lose that identity of having been that guy, that soldier, and then, or that law enforcement officer. And then they're just, they're just, everyday joe now and it's oh, really man, hard you, because 
Yes, you work so hard to become that guy and get stick your nose into all of that stuff, and then when it's gone, you're kind of floundering. Like, what the fuck do I do now? You know? Yeah, it's it's a it's very challenging. And look, in my case, it was a. I mean, I didn't. I didn't plan on that day being in my last undercover drug deal. I didn't plan on that being my last one, but some obviously other people had other plans. And and um, from that day on, I I, I couldn't. I ha my whole life changed. My whole life changed, and I had to. I had no choice but to face uh, reinvention, and it was difficult. It was difficult because number one, you know, I I was dealing with a brain injury. By the way, I didn't know how to brain injury. Everybody else knew it, but I didn't. <laughs> you know, everybody else knew something's wrong with this guy. And I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm fine. What are you talking about? Funny how that works. <laughs> then I had a, uh, I still have a permanently damaged inner ear. And then uh, uh, other problems that came with it. And then with the shock and awe, how it happened. And then the shock and awe post that incident. And then, and then, uh, um, and then everything else comes crashing on you because you're living at, at this high, high speed life. And then it comes to a sudden stop, and then everything comes. To, everything comes to you, the the nightmares, the everything comes. All the all the all the near misses, all the near hits, all the close calls, they all just come back to you because you're no longer suppressing that with daily activity. You're not trying to. You're not trying to move forward and push through it anymore. And once wait, wait, you once go. you stop, it catches up with you. Hey. It just catches up. Lou, let's back up a little bit and tell us tell us a little bit about you know you don't have to go into detail but you know what you were doing working undercover what kind of deals you were doing and and what led up what kind of led up to the incident. Yeah, you know i i was um, I was in an undercover conspiracy squad and I uh, um, you know how those units are made up they have they have different units and stuff like that so I, I would I, mean, I would I would kind of loan myself out to different if they needed. Uh, a person that fit the profile, I, I'd go do it. We got Jamaicans wanted to buy uh, a thousand pounds of weed. Who wants to be the middle guy? I'll do it. I'll negotiate that. You know, we got we got guys from Mexico looking for some guns. Who wants to make the introduction? I can take care of that. You know, and and I was, I volunteered for it. I look back on it now. I'm like, what the hell was I doing? But because it was fun and dangerous at the same time, and and so on this particular day, I mean, I'm. I negotiated a bunch of cocaine with some, for some guy, and, and uh, he was originally out of Mexico. And uh, I remember this guy was interesting because he he was missing he was missing his I think two or three of his fingers on his hand. So I called him Claw Claw Man, right? That was kind of my nickname for him. I was introduced to this guy through a DEA informant, and who was really solid. This guy was really solid, and he did a great job in, of edifying me to these people, right? I went by I went by different names: Chino, Potrillo, El Gallero, all sorts of different names. Good times. And this guy, we, we, we worked a deal for a bunch of cocaine to be brought over. Uh, we had lunch with the guy. We sat down, and, and then we did the right thing by what we call surprise flash, and we did that. And so the guy says, okay, cool. And I said, you're not going to ever see that paper again, which the money, until you bring me my stuff. Briefing, we briefed the, uh, the, the, we briefed the, the SWAT unit that was there to kind of cover during that flash, and, and uh, we briefed them. A very detailed briefing, and then again later on, when they confirmed they were going to bring this the, the cocaine over to us, we briefed them again, and uh, and it just started getting dark, started getting late. You know, the the supervisor in the group ended up changing the the arrest signal, and and because uh, it got dark, and I was like, that's clue number one. So I should I take ownership of that. You know what I mean? I've been to a lot of undercover schools, and you don't change you don't change certain things. You know, and so. And, uh, but they changed it in the middle of it because it's getting dark. And I'm like, okay. And, and then, and then, uh, um, they bring it over. I, I go look at it in the car and then it was, I'm counting keys, man. I'm like, okay, they're all there. And I saw nothing. Nobody's moving, you know? And of course it's, it's merely seconds, but it feels like hours. That's a bad thing. Every, everybody's getting antsy. Everybody's getting antsy. Uh, bad guys are getting antsy. Claw man's getting Nancy and bad guys are like, what's going on here? You know what I mean? It was like, I don't know, man. In my mind, I always relive that horrible scene in Scarface where they go in a hotel and they tie the guy up and they chop him up with a with a, with a saw, yeah. man. And so, and and uh, uh, and nothing's happening. And I'm counting and I count them again and nothing's happening. So I'm like, shit. 
I, I think that some civilians who have never been there don't understand those moments. Like you said, it was probably, what, 10, 20 seconds? But yeah. that's a lifetime when you're waiting to know the next thing, and then the bad guys are looking at you like, what the it's, fuck is going on? Yeah, it's time to put up or shut up. And, and I've, been, I, I've been there, Lou. It's a bad yeah. feeling. And, and, and you're there, and, and I'm counting these damn, and they brought it, but all, they brought all the cocaine that I had asked for, all of it. I'm like, wow. You guys came yeah, through. Does that ever happen? <laughs> now I have to come through, right? So now we like, okay, where's the money? It's over there. So we walk back over to my Firebird, and I slowly open up the hatch on it. By then, police should have already showed up, and we just wanted to get this guy back and extradite it to his home country because he was wanted out there as well. And and of course, guys brought cocaine. We're just going to arrest them, and so. Nothing happens. Finally, there's movement. And I'm playing dumb. I mean, I mean, it's not hard to play dumb, but I had to play dumb. I had to play dumb really, really bad. Like I'm delay, trying to delay, get the money. I can't reach the money. Anxiety <laughs> levels through the roof. Uh, bad guy. I mean, I can see the sweat coming off the guy. I, at any moment, I felt the guns on the come out. So, right, what are you, are you, are you playing games or what the heck's going on, right? And uh, finally, police show up, man. And per, per the briefing, um, you know, I, I went to lay down next to my Firebird. My partner just kind of steps backward, and he gets picked up by by the boss. And um, as I'm laying down, I hear I hear footsteps. You know, you I you've done that so many times. You know, it's good guy footsteps versus bad guy footsteps. You know, I can tell the just the the, the cadence of the step. And uh, and here comes this guy, and he comes around, and 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 as I'm laying down. I have flashbang go off right over here next to me. Bad guy over here, flashbang goes off between his legs. And I'm like, oh shit, I'm probably next. And as I'm laying down, I just feel a, a swift kick underneath in my, on, on my face right here. Uh, like some guy was getting me hit a, get a, hit a, a goal in on a, on a football game, you know, trying to hit the, the ball in. And the guy, and then he continues just kicking, 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 kicking in the back of my head, in my ear, in my face. And, and I was like, what the heck's going on here man? and it was it was i knew who was doing it but my body my mind says it can't be that you don't train for that you don't train to get your ass kicked by your own guys you don't train for that that scenario never i used to teach defensive tactics for undercover narcs and and just to for unconventional fighting inside of a car in tight quarters you name it you never train for that so what did i do i just took an ass beating and the body wire recorded the whole thing. The dude beat my ass for almost three minutes. Just kept smashing in my face, back of my head after he kicked me several times. And all he kept saying was, if you did what you're supposed to do, this wouldn't be happening to you. And I'm confused at that point. I'm like, what are, what are we talking about? You're talking to me, dude. I'm not, I'm not your average dude out here on the south side who's getting his ass kicked by a cop right now. And it's, it's hard for me to admit these things happen because I love police, man. I love cops. 99% of them are good guys. It's that 1% that just screwed up for everybody, man. And um, eventually he stops. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm just going to brace myself right here on the asphalt. Because if I don't, if I roll over and he sees a gun, he's going to shoot me. If I make any movements, he's going to shoot me. So it, it was bad. And, and it was very difficult to process that. And then finally someone comes around and handcuffs me. And I'm so, I've never been so thankful to be handcuffed in my life because I knew that at that point someone's going to pick me up. At and, least that and, way you think it's over or hope it's over. Here's what's crazy about it, man. The guy who handcuffs me, I can tell he knows who I am by the way he spoke to me. Because they spoke to everyone else in Spanish and they spoke to me in English. So he knows who I am. And he picks me up and I'm, and I'm, you know, I don't know. When you get your head kicked in for a while, you're you're not you're just kind of in a weird place in your head. So I'm a little aggressive at that point. And he and he kind of grabs me because he tells me to calm down. I said, No, you 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 calm down, bro. Look at me. I said, Turn turn me around and look at me. I said, Look at me. He goes, What do you mean? The guy turns me around. He goes, Whoa. He goes, Who did that? I said, He did that. And at that point, it was a oh shit moment somebody screwed up and my god it, this and, and the heartbreak just continued to happen from that point on i sit i get sit down 
They don't call meds. I had to request meds. I had to wow. request meds. And and now I see these guys huddled around and it's an oh shit moment. How did that happen? Long so, and quick, short, man. Quick question. The, the guy who was actually doing the kicking, had you ever met him before? This guy had covered me on several, several, several deals. Several deals. So, so there's no way he doesn't me. know who you are? No way. I trusted this guy with my life many, many times. Within inches of, I trusted this guy for me to lay down in between beds in a hotel and they would shoot over me in live fire situations. That's how much I trusted these people. And months before that, I had done a, another uh, op and with a, a guy, uh, MS-13 guy, bring me a bunch of heroin. The guy got away from them. In the post briefing, I you're supposed to be, you know, breaks things stuff down. I said, guys, you guys, I, I asked you guys not to come out in a single file, but half moon shaped this guy because this guy is, he's squirrely. And they came out in a single file and they lost him. He ended up taking four or five families hostage that night. It was a mess in, in my town. And, and uh, I spoke out about it. They didn't like that. Shortly after my incident that I, that I talked about earlier, I got a phone call from one of my old partners and who's, who's passed away now. And he says, hey man, in Spanish, he says to me, supe, supe que la traían contigo, meaning I heard they kind of had it out for you. Like, what do you mean? He goes, I can't talk right now, but I'll call you later. Uh, Frank ended up dying like 10 days later. And, and, and uh, I never found out what he knew. And so, but the long and short is this man, uh, it took me four years to recover from this whole thing. I drank my ass up. They gave me pain pills. Like it was like stacks. Like I was like freaking, like I was like a drug dealer again, man. <laughs> you know, I had stacks of pain pills, Valium, Oxycontin, you name it. A and then the whole uh, brain injury side of it, um, married to, at the time to someone who really didn't care of my recovery or what had happened, um, was sort of disconnected with it. And, 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 um, it was very difficult, a very difficult time in my life. And so the only saving grace for me, I reached a point where I had to say, do I gotta stop drinking a 12 pack a day? Chasing, I had to stop chasing the pills with beer, the Neurontin, the Gabapentin, all this stuff that's horrible, man, horrible. And, and I had to stop that cold turkey. But then you deal from there, you start dealing with the nightmares, all your near misses, all the near hits, just come crashing into your life because all I had now was time to lay around in my house, recover. And that was four years of just almost every single night I had just, it was rough nights. And, 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 and the ideation of suicide just all of a sudden just creeps up on you, man. And it's horrible. You can't shake it. You're like, what, 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 what how does that come about? Like, where does that come from? It's just a combination of a lot of things. Like you guys mentioned Victor Avila and, 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 and I spoke to him before and I read his book and there's a point where he says, it's like the, you're in, you're, like, it's like the devil is in the room with you. Yep. And I was like, shit, I thought I was the only one who ever thought that. Well, we all, we all do it at some point, you know, when you're sitting there in that dark room after, you know, you're there for four years. So, you know, so many guys have been there and they don't know. You know, it's almost like there's no escape. And, and I think Victor's analogy of the devil being in the room with you is perfect because yeah. you know he's there. You can't yep. see him, but you can fucking feel it. Yeah. You know? and, and that's the thing. And I think a lot of that has to do with that sense of purpose. When we were talking earlier, you, know, you go, you spend your whole life trying to become that guy. And when you're not that guy anymore, or you feel that guy flipping away, you think, well, what the fuck is the purpose? Where you know, what do we do tomorrow? Yeah. And, and if you don't find that man, I, I mean, and, and unfortunately the sad truth is a lot of guys don't find it. They yeah. don't. And, and you know how I found, I found it in books. I picked up entrepreneur books. I picked up, I read Donald Trump business books. I read Robert Kiyosaki business books. I mean, I read, I just read. Just and so it was part of my therapy. <laughs> and it was part of my therapy because, because 
I was having trouble tracking my vision. I was I was driving when I shouldn't have been driving. I, you know, I started I started real out I, because I was missing that lifestyle again. I would hang out in places that I used to hang out at when I would meet drug dealers and stuff like that. You know, like those kind of bars. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing here, man? It's the Why attraction to dangerous behavior, man. Hey, look, yeah. quick question. You know, before we kind of move on into the next chapter, uh, and again, you don't have to get into specifics, but was there ever any discipline uh, for for that guy? Yeah. Or any of those guys that you and, and with all due respect to the good guys out there, okay, I'm talking about this bad guy. Um, when when I was interviewed by uh, by their internal affairs, I was actually it was more like an interrogation. They interviewed me for probably uh, I'm gonna say for hours and probably four hours, four hours they interviewed me. There was a break in between. Like you guys want lunch? When they interviewed him, it was 45 minutes. My, my, my recorded copy of my interview was like two and a half inches thick a stack of paper. His was just like that. The only discipline that came from it was, was uh, um, they just retrained them on not to be kicking guys in the back of the head, right? Not to um, kick other cops in the head, yeah. yeah. It's good yeah. training. And, but here's, here's he, he he got promoted a little later on, but then he ended up getting demoted because he showed up drunk on a swap call. Okay, and ended up getting uh, they. He I think he was able to retire or something like that. But the whole crazy bit about this is that I had to reach a point in my life, man, where I had to I had to forgive this person for doing that because I sure. was I was pl I had bad intentions, man. Sure. I, I knew exactly where he lived. I knew I knew all sorts of stuff that they didn't know I knew. I had bad, bad intentions. I knew everything about his wife. I knew everything about him. Um, he forgot that I'd been to his house before and I was not in a good place. And I had to reach a point where I had to forgive. And it was just in time because one day I'm with my son and we're in a store and I look to my left and there he's standing right there. And, and uh, it was, it was very hard, but yeah. I reached a point in my heart where I had to forgive. Uh, I'm glad I did. Cause had I not, uh, it was just, I, I, you know, what would have been so messed up is all the good stuff that I had done in my life. I would have been known for that incident right there. There you go. Yep. Yeah, we know we know a little bit about that. Yeah, Boots, you know, Boots and I can definitely relate with your story, brother. Um, you know, and, and on this podcast, we have pointed out, and we like to point out, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, yeah. When it comes to law enforcement. You know, and this is definitely falls under the bad and the ugly, and it happens. And if you don't talk about it and point it out, you know, th then it's not real, right? If we just talk about how great law enforcement is and all that in this podcast, it's not real because there are some bad, man, and this, this is a great example of it. Now, same, same analogy, man, is you, you can't you can't move past it unless you address it. You, yep. you have to think it's the law enforcement community can't get past it unless we, you know, sort out the bad apples. That's how, you know, the, the whole George Floyd incident. And all that. Yep. So it, it's a mark on law enforcement, but it, it's very much the exception and not the rule. Exactly. Absolutely right. I believe that firmly. And, and, you know, but, you know, it's so nuts, man. And, and as a child, I, one of the reasons why I chose law enforcement was because, because of a cop like that. And my dad was out and my dad said, look, I deserve, I, sh I, I deserve to get arrested. He said, uh, but I don't deserve what happened to me. And I said, what happened? And I'm a kid. He goes, I was drunk on the street. I got into a fight. Police showed up and I got stupid with them and they arrested me. And that's, I deserve that. But when they put me in the car, I didn't deserve getting the door slammed on me half a dozen times or so until they broke my ankle. And I remember as a kid, man, walking through the neighborhood, looking for witnesses to see if anyone saw anything. I remember as a kid going to the police station in my area, finally complaint. I remember that. And I was like, I still wanted to be a cop because I want to be the guy who didn't do that. And you know what's so fucked up is that I ended up retiring because of a cop like that. Yeah, that's ironic. 
it's so weird man and so and so and so um but i didn't allow those things to make me bitter i just had to get better from all that you know and and, and it allowed me to transition into the world of business uh and, and it and i'm a firm believer man that we're we're we can create our own opportunities we can create our own luck with preparation and timing you create your own luck and one day i'm visiting some friends and they say hey don't you speak spanish i say yes and I said weren't you a cop or a soldier i said yeah i was both he goes well i know a guy who's here from mexico with the cable network filming they need a guy who can teach his actors how to do like the weapons and and all that cool guy stuff i'm like i can help i'm like okay that's how i got into tv and movies and and so and so that gave me what i found from that i found a safe space so to speak where i knew i could still relive those moments again that i was missing in a safer environment well it's it's funny cuz you were talking about it earlier and i could i could kind of see it playing out when you were talking about hey we need a guy to go you know do this introduction with the jamaicans and all this oh we need a guy to go and set up the cocaine deal acting's no different Hey, we need a guy to play this role. Hey, we need a guy yeah. and you strike me as the kind of guy like, "Hey, shit, I'll do it." Yeah. 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 And and I found that and I found that I I pursued acting at that point because I'm like, "Well, this is therapeutic, man." Like I feel good afterward. I'm still getting I'm still I'm still feeding that that adrenaline that we would get that we get shot up with, you know? Cool and the thing about and, acting though is you can turn it off. You can turn it off. Yeah. And and so and so and that's how I got in the film. I I did a short film called Duress based on some undercover work that I have done. I don't know if you guys had a chance to watch it or not, but very proud of it. It won at several film festivals. Uh and then I got on the show called Breaking Bad and a show called Gang Related, uh, other movies as well. I I I've gotten to act and and learn how, uh, in 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 the Mohawk language uh uh and different things and I I I found it to be very helpful because let's admit it you leave police work you're going to leave with some post traumatic stress and i refuse to be a statistic i refuse to go down like that i refuse to be that retired cop who who goes out in in, in with in under bad situation like that ends up in some small little trailer in some in some you know whole dunk city and like they do in movies man i'm not going to be that die hard guy living in the trailer <laughs> drinking yourself to death yes. you know lou you know we can relate you know bootsy and i both of our both of our law enforcement careers ended up uh, unceremoniously. Mm-hmm. It's a good word, right? But so nice word. but you know, I like you talk about how you had to forgive that guy cuz and drop it. We we had similar uh similar issues, but if you carry it with you, then they win. You yeah. have to cuz nobody gives a fuck is the bottom line. Nobody cares. Right. Like right. your anger and all that, like like if you're angry at, at ATF management or or your police department, whoever it is, they don't, yeah. nobody cares. They don't right? There, there is nobody. Right. That, so you had to drop, you had to forgive and just drop that anger because if you had carried that anger with you for the rest of your life, you lose. Right. You lose. They win forever. That guy yep. gets to beat you twice in that scenario. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, guys like us aren't wired that way. We don't we don't let you win twice. You know, right. That's that's why you either cut it the fuck loose or or you know you let it drag you down yeah and 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 it was really kicking my ass for a long time and and uh a lot of drinking a lot of pills a lot of uh depression a suicide ideation out of just pure anger and and it wasn't until the day when when i i would visual i was i would picture where am i going to do it 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 what's it going to look like all the damn time it was horrible and that stuff doesn't leave you. yeah it doesn't leave you it's really weird it's like a devil man it doesn't leave you it's a thief you know and so uh one day i was so i was i was under some serious uh, medication and alcohol and and i had enough wits to know to force myself to sleep and and at night I would have nightmares that men in soldier uniforms were coming into my house. I got so paranoid that I would position my bed so I can see the glass door cuz I, I I would have dreams of them doing a dynamic entry to my glass door. <laughs> I was going nuts. And so I took my gun apart the next morning. I just disassembled it, 
left it right in that place and then touch it for like two, three years. And, and I just left it alone, man. And I had to keep things in front of me that, that, that were reminders of me of why I had a lot to live for. You know, was, when you're in that that zone there that you're talking about, Lou, you're in the red. That's what we call it. You're, in the red. you're like a car yeah. whose whose engine is is the RPMs are way up there. You're at eight, yeah. nine, ten, and uh, you know if you do that with a car, that engine's going to blow up eventually. You yeah. can't sustain it. And and you know we've been there. And when you're in that red, man, again the body can't sustain it. And I truly believe it takes some years off your life. Yeah. Uh, I, I truly believe that. So if you don't figure out how to get out of that, you know, how to, how to get out of that high revving and, and idle back down, something's going to give. Yep. You know? And thank God you, you figured it out and you found a way, you know, to stop with the pills and, and, to, you know, forgive and not forget, but at least forgive and move on. And you became a, an actor and an entrepreneur, which is,